it remains for us to summarize and conclude. To summarize the history of a science is to summarize the science itself, and we are therefore to recapitulate the great principles of initiation, as preserved and transmitted through all the ages. Magical science is the absolute science of equilibrium. It is essentially religious. It presided at the formation of dogmas in the antique world and has been thus the nursing mother of all civilizations. O oh, chaste and mysterious mother who, in giving milk of poetry and inspiration to the dawning generations, didst cover thy face and breast. Before all things she directs us to believe in God and to adore without seeking to define him, since a God in definition is to some extent a finite God. And after deity she points to eternal mathematics and equilibrated forces as to the sovereign principles of things. It is said in the Bible that God has ordered all things according to weight, number and measure. Omnia in pondere et numero et mensura disposut deus. Weight is equilibrium. Number is quantity, measure is proportion. These three, and these are the eternal or divine basis of the science of nature. Here now is the formula of equilibrium. Harmony results from the analogy of contraries. Number is the scale of analogies, the proportion of which is measure. The entire occult philosophy of the Zohar might be termed the science of equilibrium. The key of numbers is found in the Sefer Yetzirah. Their generation is analogous to the affiliation of ideas and the production of forms. On this account the illuminated hierophants of the Kabbalah combined the hieroglyphic signs of numbers, ideas and forms in their sacred alphabet. The combinations of this alphabet give equations of ideas, and comprise by way of indication all possible combinations in natural forms. According to Genesis, God made man in his image, but as man is the living synthesis of creation, it follows that creation itself is made in the likeness of God. There are three things in the universe, the spirit, the plastic mediator and matter. The ancients assigned to spirit, as its immediate instrument, that igneous fluid to which they gave the generic name of sulfur. To the plastic mediator, they assigned the name of mercury, because of the symbolism represented by the caduceus. To matter, they gave the name of salt, because of the fixed salt which remains after combustion, resisting the further action of fire. Sulfur was compared with the father on account of the generative action of fire. Mercury with the mother, because of its power of attraction and reproduction. And salt, in fine, was the child, or that substance which is subjected to education by nature. For them also the creative substance was one, and the name which they gave it was light. Positive or igneous light was volatile sulfur. Light in the negative state, or made visible by the vibrations of fire, was the fluidic or ethereal mercury. And light neutralized, or shadow, the coagulated or fixed composite under the form of earth, was termed salt. After such manner did Hermes Trismegistus formulate his symbol, which is called the emerald tablet. That which is above is like that which is below and that which is below is like that which is above, for the operations of the wonders of the one thing. This means that the universal movement is produced by the analogies of fixed and volatile, the volatile tending to be fixed and the fixed to become volatile, thus producing a continual exchange between the modes of the one substance and, from the fact of the exchange, the combinations of universal form in everlasting renewal. The fire is Osiris, or the sun. The light is Isis, or the moon. They are the father and mother of that grand telesma which is the universal substance, not that they are its creators but rather its generating powers, the combined effort of which produces the fixed or earth, whence Hermes says that this force has reached its plenary manifestation when earth has been formed therefrom. Osiris is not therefore God, even for the great hierophants of the Egyptian sanctuary. He is the igneous or luminous shadow of the intellectual principle of life and hence in the supreme moment of initiation a flying voice whispered in the ear of the adept that dubious revelation, Osiris is a black god. Woe to the recipient whose understanding had not been raised by faith above the purely physical symbols of Egyptian revelation. Such words would become for him a formula of atheism, and his mind would be struck with blindness. But for the believer, more exalted in intelligence, those same words sounded like an earnest of the most sublime hopes. It was as if the initiator said to him, My child, you mistake a lamp for the sun, but that lamp is only a star of night. Still, the true sun exists. Leave therefore the night and seek the day. That which the ancients understood by the four elements in no wise signified simple bodies, but rather the four elementary manifestations of the one substance. These modes were represented by the sphinx, its wings corresponding to air, the woman's breasts to water, the body of the bull to earth, and the lion's claws to fire. 
The one substance, thrice threefold in essential mode and tetradic in the form of manifestation, such as the secret of the three pyramids, triangular in respect of their elevation, square at the base and guarded by the Sphinx. In raising these monuments Egypt attempted to erect the Herculean pillars of universal science. Sands have accumulated, centuries have passed, but the pyramids in their eternal greatness still propound to the nations that enigma of which the solution is lost. As to the Sphinx, it seems to have sunk in the dust of ages. The great empires of Daniel have reigned by turn upon the earth and have gone down into the tomb, overwhelmed by their own weight. Conquests on the field of battle, monuments of labor, results of human passions, all are engulfed with the symbolic body of the Sphinx. Now only the human head rises over the desert sands as if looking for the universal empire of thought. Divine or die. Such was the terrible dilemma proposed by the Sphinx to the candidates for Theban royalty. The reason is that the secrets of science are actually those of life. The alternatives are to reign or to serve, to be or not to be. The natural forces will break us if we do not put them to use for the conquest of the world. There is no mean between the height of kinghood and the abyss of the victim state. Unless we are content to be counted among those who are nothing because they ask not why or what they are. The composite form of the Sphinx also represents by hieroglyphical analogy the four properties of the universal agent, that is to say, the astral light, dissolving, coagulating, heating and cooling. These four properties, directed by the will of man, can modify all phases of nature, producing life or death, health or disease, love or hatred, wealth even or poverty, in accordance with the given impulsion. They can place all the reflections of the light at the service of imagination. They are the paradoxical solution of the wildest questions which can be set for transcendental magic. Specimens of these paradoxical questions shall here follow, together with the answers thereto. 1. Is it possible to escape death? 2. Is there such a thing as the philosophical stone, and what must be done to find it? 3. Is it possible to be served by spirits? 4. What is meant by the key, ring and seal of Solomon? 5. Is it possible to predict the future by reliable calculations? 6. Can good or evil be worked at will by means of magical power? 7. What must be done to become a true magician? 8. What are the precise forces put in operation by black magic? We term these questions paradoxical because they are outside all that is understood as science, while at the same time they seem negatived by faith. If propounded by an uninitiated person, they are merely foolhardy while their complete solution, if given by an adept, would seem like a sacrilege. God and nature alike have closed the sanctuary of transcendent science and this in such a manner that, beyond a certain limit, he who knows would speak to no purpose, because he would not be understood. The revelation of the great magical secret is therefore happily impossible. The replies which we are about to give will be the last possible expression of the word in magic, and they will be put in all clearness, but we do not guarantee to make them comprehensible to our readers. In respect of the first and second, it is possible to escape death after two manners, in time and in eternity. We escape it in time by the cure of diseases and by avoiding the infirmities of old age. We escape it in respect of eternity by perpetuating in memory personal identity amidst the transformations of existence. Let it be certified. 1. That the life resulting from motion can only be maintained by the succession and the perfecting of forms. 2 that the science of perpetual motion is the science of life. 3. That the purpose of this science is the correct apprehension of equilibrated influences. 4. That all renewal operates by destruction, each generation therefore involving a death and each death a generation. Let us now further certify, with the ancient sages, that the universal principle of life is a substantial movement or a substance which is eternally and essentially moved and mover, invisible and impalpable, in a volatile state and manifesting materially when it becomes fixed by the phenomena of polarization. This substance is indefectible, incorruptible and consequently immortal, but its manifestations in the world of form are subject to eternal mutation by the perpetuity of movement. Thus all dies because all lives, and if it were possible to make any form eternal, then motion would be arrested and the only real death would be thus created. To imprison a soul forever in a mummified human body, such would be the terrible solution of that magical paradox concerning pretended immortality in the same body and on the same earth. All is regenerated by the universal dissolvent of the first substance. The force of this dissolvent is concentrated in the quintessence, 
that is to say, at the equilibrating center of a dual polarity. The four elements of the ancients are the four forces of the universal magnet, represented by the figure of a cross, which cross revolves indefinitely about its own center and so propounds the enigma respecting the quadrature of the circle. The creative word speaks from the middle of the cross and cries, it is finished. It is in the exact proportion of the four elementary forms that we must seek the universal medicine of bodies, even as the medicine of the soul is offered by religion in him who gives himself eternally on the cross for the salvation of the world. The magnetic state and polarization of the heavenly bodies results from their equilibrated gravitation about suns, which are the common reservoirs of their electromagnetism. The vibration of the quintessence about common reservoirs manifests by light, and the polarization of light is revealed by colors. White is the color of the quintessence. This color condenses towards its negative pole as blue and becomes fixed as black, while it condenses towards its positive pole as yellow and becomes fixed as red. Thus centrifugal life proceeds always from black to red, passing by white, and centripetal life returns from red to black, following the same path. The four intermediates or mixed hues produce with the three primary colors what are called the seven colors of the prism and the solar spectrum. These seven colors form seven atmospheres or seven luminous zones round each sun, and the planet which is dominant in each zone is magnetized in a manner analogous to the color of its atmosphere. In the depths of the earth, metals are formed like planets in the sky, by the particular influences of a latent light which decomposes when traversing certain regions. To take possession of a subject in which the metallic light is latent, before it becomes specialized, and drive it to the extreme positive pole, that is to say, to the live red, by the help of a fire derived from the light itself, such is the secret in full of the great work. It will be understood that this positive light at its extreme degree of condensation is life itself in a fixed state, serving as a universal dissolvent and as a medicine for all kingdoms of nature. But to extract from marcasite, stibium and philosophical arsenic the living and bisexual metallic sperm, we must have a prime dissolvent which is a mineral saline menstruum, and there must be, moreover, the concurrence of magnetism and electricity. The rest proceeds of itself in a single vessel, being the athenor, and by the graduated fire of one lamp. The adepts say that it is a work of women and children. The heat, light, electricity and magnetism of modern chemists and physicists were for the ancients elementary phenomenal manifestations of one substance, called or, odd and ob, that is to say, Ohud ud. Ad is the active, ob the passive, and or is the name of the bisexual and equilibrated composite which is signified when the hermetic philosophers speak of gold. Vulgar gold is metallized ore and philosophical gold is the same ore in the state of a soluble gem. Theoretically, according to the transcendental science of antiquity, the philosophical stone which heals all diseases and accomplishes the transmutation of metals exists therefore incontestably. Does it, however, or can it, exist in fact? If we answer this in the affirmative, no one will believe, and the simple statement shall stand as a paradoxical solution of the paradoxes expressed by the two first questions, without dealing with the problem as to what must be done in order to find the philosophical stone. M. De la Police would reply in our place that in order to find one must of necessity seek, unless indeed discovery is a matter of chance. Enough has been said to direct and facilitate research. The third and fourth questions concern the ministry of spirits and the key, seal and ring of Solomon. When the Savior of the world, at his temptation in the desert, overcame the three lusts which keep the soul in bondage, that is to say, the lust of the appetites, lust of ambition and lust of greed, it is written that the angels came down to serve him. The explanation is that spirits are subject to the sovereign spirit, and he is the sovereign spirit who binds the rebellious turbulence and unlawful propensities of the flesh. It should be noted at the same time that to reverse the natural order of communication subsisting between things which are, is opposed to the law of providence. We do not find that the Savior of the world and his apostles evoked the souls of the dead. The immortality of the soul, being one of the most consoling dogmas of religion, is reserved for the aspirations of faith and will never be proved by facts accessible to the criticism of science. Loss of reason, or its distraction at the very least is hence and will be always the penalty of those who dare to pry into the other life with the eyes of this world only. Hence also magical traditions always represent the spirits of the dead as responding to evocations with sad and angry countenances. They complain of being troubled in their repose and they proffer only reproaches and menaces. 
The keys of Solomon are religious and rational forces expressed by signs, and their use is not so much in the evocation of spirits as to shield us from aberration in experiences relative to the occult sciences. The seal is the synthesis of the keys and the ring indicates its use. The ring of Solomon is at once round and square, and it represents the mystery of the quadrature of the circle. It is composed of seven squares so arranged that they form a circle. Their bezels are round and square, one being of gold and the other of silver. The ring should be a filigree of the seven metals. In the silver setting a white stone is placed and in the gold one there is a red stone. The white stone bears the sign of the macrocosm, while the microcosm is on the red stone. When the ring is worn upon the finger, one of the stones should be turned inward and the other outward, accordingly as it is desired to command spirits of light or darkness. The plenary powers of this ring can be accounted for in a few words. The will is omnipotent when armed with the living forces of nature. Thought is idle and dead until it manifests by word or sign. It can therefore neither spur nor direct will. The sign, being the indispensable form of thought, is the necessary instrument of will. The more perfect the sign the more powerfully is the thought formulated, and the will is consequently directed with more force. Blind faith moves mountains, and what therefore would be possible to faith if enlightened by complete and indubitable science? If the soul could concentrate its plenary understanding and energy in the utterance of a single word, would not that word be all-powerful? The ring of Solomon, with its double seal, typifies all science and faith of the Magi expressed by one sign. It symbolizes the powers of heaven and earth and the sacred laws which rule them, whether in the celestial macrocosm or in the microcosm of man. It is the talisman of talismans and the pantacle which is above pantacles. As a sign of life it is omnipotent, but it is without efficacy as a dead sign. Intelligence and faith, the intelligence of nature and faith in its eternally active cause, of such is the life of signs. The profound study of natural mysteries may alienate the casual observer from God because mental fatigue paralyzes the aspirations of the heart. It is in this sense that the occult sciences may be dangerous and even fatal for certain personalities. Mathematical exactitude, the absolute rigor of natural laws, their harmony and simplicity, suggest to many an inevitable, eternal, inexorable mechanism, and for such as these providence recedes behind the iron wheels of a clock in perpetual motion. They fail to reflect on the indubitable fact of freedom and autocracy in thinking beings. A man disposes at his will of creatures organized like himself. He can snare birds in the air, fish in the water and wild beasts in the forest. He can cut down or burn entire forests. He can mine and blast rocks, or even mountains. He can modify all forms about him. And yet, notwithstanding the supreme analogies of nature, he refuses to believe that other intelligent beings might at their will disintegrate and consume worlds, extinguish suns by a breath or reduce them to starry dust. Being so great that they are too much for our faculty of sight, even as we, in our turn, are probably inappreciable to the eye of the mite or worm. And if such beings exist without the universe being destroyed a thousand times over, must we not admit that they are under obedience to a supreme will, a wise and omnipotent force, which forbids them to annihilate worlds, even as it forbids us to destroy the swallow's nest and the chrysalis of the butterfly? For the magus who is conscious of this power in the deep places of his nature and who discerns in universal law the instruments of eternal justice, the seal of Solomon, his keys and his ring are tokens of supreme royalty. The next questions concern the prediction of things to come by means of reliable calculations and the working of good or evil by magical influence. The answers are in this wise. Two chess players of equal skill being seated at a table and having opened the game, which of them will win? Assuredly the more watchful of the two. If I knew the preoccupations of both, I could foresee certainly the result of their match. To foresee is to win at chess, and it is the same in the game of life. In life nothing comes by chance. Chance is the unforeseen, but that which the ignorant fail to perceive in advance has been accounted for already by the sage. All events, like all forms, result either from a conflict or from a balancing of forces, which forces can be represented by numbers. The future may thus be determined in advance by calculation. Every extreme action is counterpoised by an equivalent reaction. So laughter presages tears, and for this reason our Saviour said, Blessed are those who mourn. He said also, and again for the same reason, He that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Today Nebuchadnezzar is a god, tomorrow he will be changed into a beast. 
Today Alexander makes his triumphal entry into Babylon and has incense offered to him on all the altars. But tomorrow he will die in a state of degraded drunkenness. The future is in the past, and the past is also in the future. When genius foresees, it remembers. Effects are linked together so inevitably and so exactly to their causes, and become on their own part the causes for further effects in such conformity with the first as regards their manner of production, that a single fact may reveal to a seer an entire succession of mysteries. The coming of Christ makes that of Antichrist a certainty, but the advent of Antichrist will precede the triumph of the Holy Spirit. The money-seeking epoch in which we now live is the precursor of more lavish charities and of greater good works than the world has yet known. But it must be understood that the will of man modifies blind causes and that a single impetus started by him may change the equilibrium of an entire world. If such is man's power in the world under his dominion, what must be that of the intelligences which rule the suns? The least of the egregores, with a breath, and by dilating suddenly the latent caloric of our earth, might shatter and reduce it into a cloud of dust. Man also can dissipate by a breath all the happiness of one of his kind. Human beings are magnetized like worlds. Like suns, they irradiate their particular light. Some are more absorbent, some give forth more freely. No one is isolated in this world. Each is a fatality or a providence. Augustus and Cinna encounter. Both are proud and implacable, and hereof is fatality. That fatality makes Cinna seek to slay Augustus, who is impelled as fatally to punish him, but he elects to forgive. Here fatality is changed into providence, and the epic of Augustus, inaugurated by this sublime beneficence, was worthy to witness the birth of him who said, Forgive your enemies. By extending his mercy to Cinna, Augustus atoned for all the revenge of Octavius. So long as man is subject to the dictates of fatality, he is profane. That is to say, a man who must be excluded from the sanctuary of knowledge, because in his hands knowledge would become a terrible instrument of destruction. On the contrary, the man who is free, who governs by understanding the blind instincts of life, is essentially a preserver and repairer, for nature is the domain of his power and the temple of his immortality. When the uninitiated seeks to do good the result is evil. On the other hand, the true initiate can never will to do evil. If he strikes it is to chastise and to cure. The breath of the uninitiated is deadly, that of the initiate is life-giving. He who is profane suffers that others may suffer also, but the initiate endures in order that others may be spared. He who is profane steeps his arrows in his own blood and poisons them. He who is initiated cures the most cruel wounds by a single drop of his blood. The last questions are what must be done to become a true magician and in what precisely do the powers of black magic consist.